week. I say I had a week. It tried to take me down. It had me on my knees. I've seen these weeks before and learned an important lesson. They are never only one true thing. These troubled times, a stew of emotions. The anger and fear and sadness that come on fast, mix together and transform. Not strong enough to last on their own, these emotions morph and change into one another as we stir the pot. The sadness lingers the longest, but it's not present every moment of the day. The fear comes on with a fury but dissipates, flitters away. The anger roars, asking to be seen, but then settles down to sleep. It lulls and purrs. Oh, I see you, anger. I feel you. Yes, you are mad. You have that right. But peeking through, new emotions enter, jump into the pot to make the stew richer. Here come feelings with a sweeter side. Smell the fragrance of thyme, sage, and allspice. Go straight to the heart touching it softly as the stew swirls about. Whether the fragrance released is offered by serendipity, chance, or a spirit of rescue, I can't know for sure. But all the feels are present now, it's crowder still. Sadness and joy, fear and certainty, anger and gratitude. They hold hands and come together, so I don't feel only one or two of them, but all of them, all at once. And if this stew is what life is all about, a mix of these emotions, then how can I place a weight or steady value on any one of them? Here comes another feeling flavor in my pot. I'm adding salt or vinegar or mushrooms of fear, garlic, peppers, or potatoes of joy. They all marry in one big pot, creating something new and altogether different than the sum of its parts. This stew is my life, all mixed up, a jumble, and I can't find one flavor that stands alone. I can't attach to one lone ingredient as they blend together. And tomorrow, it may all change again. I may not be eating stew. I may be feasting on cotton candy. Three years ago, when my mom got sick, kind of all at once, I was thrust into the role of caregiver, healthcare proxy, and health advocate for her. I was her voice on some really heavy matters, and I made big decisions. She had prepared me as best as anyone could. You know, my mom felt strongly about a person's right to die the way they want. And we began talking and really debating about her desire not to have any life-sustaining medical procedures like resuscitation and tube feeding. We began those discussions and debates when I was like 15. I remember it was like really emotionally charged discussions when I was a teenager and she felt so strongly that she wanted me to know what her wishes were, what her will was and what her thinking was about that. And she felt strongly and kept a very organized filing cabinet with all of the medical directives and legal documents I could ever need. And, you know, in hindsight, it was an incredible gift that my mom gave me, knowing exactly how she felt about the end of her life, communicating me to communicating to me her wishes about that. um, And then having as much of it organized before she got sick as anybody could have. But still, no one prepares you for this role. There isn't like a manual or there's no unit in school about how to take care of your aging parents and how to navigate a really complex medical world that makes decisions based on a myriad of factors that may lie outside of what's good for you in that moment or even good for your loved one. But this episode, is it isn't about navigating those worlds. This episode is about navigating the worlds that continue around us simultaneously with this struggle the pull of the world in different directions, and sometimes all at once. What some call the yin and the yang of life. Let's explore all sides. Welcome to Let the Verse Flow, a show that takes you on a creative journey to inspire your personal growth. I'm your host, Jill Hodge, 
a business writer by day, a poet, music lover, and journal enthusiast all the other times. Part performance art, part self-help, this show is unique. So let me show you rather than tell you. But first, please note, the opinions I express here are my own and not a substitute for professional help. If you need someone to talk to, please reach out to a mental health professional. Now, sit back and relax and listen to my reflections from the bright side of the beat. Forces of opposites exist in our lives. Opposites in action, in circumstance, feelings and thoughts. I can be doing one action while planning for another, feeling one emotion in the extreme, but feeling its opposite in the background. And knowing that they coexist um, has really kind of helped me to put my thoughts and feelings in their place, you know, to, to help sort of uh, categorize them and come up with a method by which I tackle some of the more challenging feelings while still remembering the complete picture of my life. So here's one example of how opposites played out in my life recently. I got a call from my mom's assisted living facility. And I'm telling you, every time I see the phone number and, and the name of the facility come up on my phone, I, I, I start to, my breath changes instantly. I get this call saying that a blood test had revealed a really alarming finding that required her to be hospitalized immediately. She had been fighting off an infection and sleeping more than usual, so it wasn't a complete surprise. But the way it had all progressed from sort of like zero to 100 in the span of a few days was really alarming. Although if I think back, it wasn't all that unusual. So she's going to the hospital, a good hospital, but one that is a two hour ride away from my home. It's very close to where she, where her assisted living facility is, but it's far from me. It's at least a hospital that I can trust and I do trust it. And that's given me oh God, the ability to be two hours away and not go crazy. You know, do I remain calm because I know this hospital is good? To some degree, I I do, I have that comfort. But do I get like sad and emotional because my mom's, of my mom's decline? Do I feel distrustful of how she will be handled even in a good hospital? Do I get angry because this was supposed to be the start of a holiday weekend where I'd have a four day rest from work and now I'm going to be rushing to the hospital all weekend. Yes, yes to all of it. I felt all of that. And how many thoughts can you have simultaneously? How many conflicting thoughts can you have at one time? And it's just emotionally exhausting. So yes to all of that. Yes to it all. And within the span of five minutes, there was this flood of emotions. Emotions all at once, not like contained in nice, neat little you know, time boxes that I could process and then move along. You know, it was just this flood of like sadness and fear and anger and unending questions. Is she bleeding internally? You know, worry and overthinking sort of coming on. You know, I'll have to cancel my plans. I have a a bank appointment. Um, I planned this beautiful day out with my best friend uh, like a month ago. You know, the restful kind of self-care I hope to do you know, which included, you know, writing for my podcast, you know, reading books, you know, I had this plan. And it was all going bye bye that weekend. And I felt sad. I I didn't feel angry about that or even shameful for for thinking of myself. I think at that point, I was just sort of sad. But this thick stew of emotions sort of came on me all at once. And this is a very reactionary state. I know that too, somewhere in the back of my mind, because I've been working on reprogramming my mind to think differently about this, to not attach to this negative spiral of extreme thoughts that aren't really entirely true. Self-care doesn't have to stop because I'm going to the hospital. It can exist in small pockets of time alongside these kind of stressful times. But right now, this extreme thinking has me in its grip. I walked home on the verge of tears, really. The call came early evening as I was heading home from work for what I thought was going to be a vacation weekend, but things just changed. 
I'm walking through the park and there's like little tears in my eyes, you know, I'm like holding back tears because I hate crying in public. But then again, then again I, I've done it more in the last three years than at any time in my life. So it's not unfamiliar. I would say my mid to late fifties is the time when I cry in public. You know, I have no one to talk to at work these days. You know, recently some really important coworkers and work friends have left my team. So there's also this strange feeling of loneliness that I can't tell anyone about at this particular moment. There's really no one to turn to here in this moment. And so the walk home is long and lonely and I cry and I sort of have these small like held back tears in public. But by the time I get to the front door of my building, I don't really care anymore. You know, the tears have come out. And here's how the verge of tears can feel for me. This is, I don't know how to cry. I do not know how to cry. The moment a heavy dark cloak weighed on my shoulders pushing out energy, but finding little release. The tears not fully formed, held back by some response to the flying bats that scattered round my cave. Some flew around my head, startled me, no stymied me. Some looked at me from crevices a lone specimen to see. Some came in close around my face. I covered my eyes as their wings unfurled to take me in. I did not know how to cry. The moment was weighed down by broken wings. I could not fly or leave this place and tears need time, quiet and space. If this was home, so let it be. I settled on a smooth rock and let the bats envelop me. So I don't know how to cry, but I'm crying nonetheless. And those of you going through this type of stress will know exactly what I mean by this. So when I enter my building, I discover that I have a package um, in the mail room. It's not a box that I'm really familiar with, not like your typical Amazon purchase. It's a box containing flowers. And I'm thinking, who sent me flowers? You know, it's not, it's not a common occurrence, but I immediately think I know who it must be. My best friend does things like this. She sends little gifts just because, but this isn't really a little gift. It's a big box of flowers. She wouldn't have known yet about my mom, so that couldn't be it. You know, I started to play a sort of mental game with myself, and I'm negotiating with myself, and I start tearing up for a moment and think, if the flowers are from her, I'm going to stop crying, and I'm going to start counting my blessings. I will dig deep into this stew of emotions and call up just one more, and this one's going to be gratitude. I think I'll feel so comforted to know she, my best friend who is so worthy, thought enough of me to send me flowers. Will these flowers counteract the sadness and the fear and the anger I feel? I don't know. Will I stop crying when I see them? So I take my box of flowers and I walk toward the elevator and see that people are waiting there. Have you ever noticed that when you are upset or don't want to be around people, There they are. It's that old Murphy's law, that feeling of getting the opposite of what you wanted. So I'm like, all right, Jill, let's pull it together. You know, people are around. It turns out, though, that it's someone that I know quite well, a really friendly, like 20 something year old neighbor who's very intuitive and brimming with this really positive spirit. It's like a natural well of positivity that he has. And, um, you know, I'm sure I look upset. I have a hard time hiding that. And 
he sees kind of the remnants of tears, no doubt. And he asks how I am and says he can see that something is wrong. You know, he looks and he really listens as I say that my mom is in the hospital and, you know, I just don't know what's next. And he doesn't like try to talk it away or come up with some little pithy thing to say. You know, he gives me this like short hug. It kind of rubs my back for like a second or two, but it's like this warm touch and it felt heartfelt, you know, it felt authentic, feels good. Somehow another side to these events starts to kind of creep in and there's caring here, you know, something to kind of counterbalance the sadness and fretting. There's a, a warmth. So I take that warmth, get out of the elevator. I thank him. And I'm in my apartment now and I open the box and take a quick cursory look at the beautiful fall arrangement. I'm trying to find the card inside and I reach for it and there's a printed message. And I think, what has my friend written to me? What's like, what's the occasion? I'm like, you know, very curious, but it isn't from my best friend. It's a thank you bouquet, a thank you for speaking to some families at my mom's assisted living facility. You know, I, I attend these um, family support meetings to offer support and answer questions as a quote unquote seasoned family member of a, at my mom's assisted living facility. And it's really kind of a dubious distinction that means that I've been through the ringer. You know, I've made more than 50 hospital visits and I've cried and I've screamed and I've fretted and I've taken action and I've consulted experts. I've really fought the system. I've learned a lot. And so I try to help other families now by answering their questions, by letting them see that things can kind of calm down a bit and our loved ones can be comforted and cared for in ways that make our kind of fretful minds sort of settle down a bit. And I do what I wish others had done for me. I help family members consider their options when deciding where to put their loved one who needs care. And so these flowers are like a thank you for that. It totally, you know, unexpected. A thank you for sharing my advice and offering support to the other families. Um, and I'm, it's weird. I'm sort of mildly disappointed that they aren't from my best friend. You know, the truth is she gives me so much already. I'm really very spoiled by her and I don't need flowers from her when I have her friendship and her love and, um, but the story I'm telling myself about this unexpected gesture in a challenging moment felt kind of good. You know, this new twist surprised me and I'm already caught off guard by this afternoon. So this incredible bouquet is now mine and I try to take it in as best I can. You know, I've, I've got to go to the hospital at this point. So I'm like, I've got to, you know, rush out, but you know, there's all of these different flowers. I mean, there's like wine colored and rust colored mums and there's coxcomb and roses and there's eucalyptus branches and green stems with red berries. It's really, it's like an enchanting bouquet and it's huge and it's wrapped in burlap in this like elegantly kind of understated way that shows it's sustainably sourced and this enormous bouquet, probably the biggest I've ever received you know, won't fit in just one vase. I'll have to like break it up and spread the flowers around the house. And it's, it's touching and it's beautiful. But then it also occurs to me that I won't be around much in the next few days to enjoy them. You know, I'll be at the hospital this weekend for long stretches for days and days. And when I get home, I'm going to be probably too tired, I think, to take care of these beautiful flowers and really, you know, take them in. Do you see what I did there? I went from zero to a hundred in a matter of seconds. I went from, wow, these are beautiful flowers to too bad. I won't be able to enjoy them. We'll get to that a little later. We'll talk about that dichotomy. But for now, I'm in the moment with these beautiful fragrant flowers and it's the roses now that are giving off the most perfume. And there's lilies too in the, in the bouquet, but the lilies, these like huge white flowers are closed up shut for the moment. Um, and they're only showing me their like green underbelly. And I wonder, will those lilies open up? I, I'm not sure if they're going to, but I hope they will. So I wipe away the tears and I just look at them for a minute. And um, what am I going to do with you? Well, 
beautiful bouquet of flowers? You know, what story do you belong to? And how does this kind gesture fit into this really challenging day? I mean, these flowers are too big to ignore. They're, they weren't solicited. It's really my pleasure to talk to families as I give them what I wish I had. And sometimes these families get emotional and I remember that kind of tender hurt I used to feel, the same hurt I felt a million times over my mom. So the flowers weren't something I needed, I thought, but they did come at a strangely unexpected and difficult time. Are they here to coexist with this hard time? Do the powers that be, you know, know that natural beauty always makes me feel close to my mom, that nature kind of comforts me? And then I think about these conflicting opposite emotions I'm feeling. You know, I recall the concept of yin and yang, you know, the good and the bad, the, the grief and the gratitude, all those opposites that play out in our lives. What's that feeling that starts to rise up in me? Oh, yeah, it's gratitude. And these situations and crises with my mom also have counterpoints, counterbalances, you know, the good trying to peek through and me seeing it through the pain. But how is this world to be navigated through this yin and yang, through the dichotomy between all the struggle that's happening around me mixed with all the good, the positive forces that are also at play? And yin and yang is a sort of dualistic framework for understanding the balance of good and bad in our lives, the, the black and white circular nesting shapes with one side that's white and the other black represent the way kind of certain factors in our lives coexist. And the yin factors, the black side, are said to represent shadow and quiet and stillness, while the yang factors, the white side, are said to represent light and hardness, expansion and action. And they kind of do this like dance in our lives and, and these factors kind of balance each other. And this interconnectedness means that we can often have struggle and joy at the same time in our lives. The struggle of my mom's hospitalization, for instance, alongside the like sensory pleasure and happiness at receiving these fragrant flowers. And because I enjoy nature so much, it's hard for me to not let some of those positive feelings come into my life when I get these flowers. And in this instance, it was at the same time that I was feeling you know, some real pain and sorrow and a lot of anxiety. So these feelings brought on by two separate, but some would say complementary forces of positive and negative happened together. That kind of feeling can overwhelm me and it has for much of my life. It's only recently as I study some Buddhist principles and meditate more regularly that I'm beginning to accept these feelings as just feelings and not something I have to put too much value in or attach narratives to. The reality is that my mom's Alzheimer's and ill health, they're progressing. I will be going to the hospital again. And when I feel sorrowful about that, I don't need to add a narrative in my head about all that that means. The loss of her, the stress and the loneliness. And so for right now, I'm just trying to feel the emotions, name and understand them and not attach anything else to them. To attach stories of future loss and to examine the meaning of her illness, that doesn't always help me right now in this moment. And in fact, it often makes it harder for me to deal with the struggle and the pain. And if you look at yin and yang at the symbol, you may have noticed that in the black space of the yin and the white space of the yang, there is a dot of the other's color. And that represents the interconnectedness of the yin and the yang. Contained within one is the presence of the other. It's a simple rendering, but it has a really powerful meaning. It's, a, you know, if applied to our emotional states, it can signify that we should expect both good and bad, sorrow and happiness, joy and pain, lightness and darkness and positive and negative to come into our lives together. I don't know about you, but I like having kind of a roadmap and some general principles to hold on to when I'm struggling. 
And there's a balance of both and they exist in relation to each other. And this duality opens the door to consider that in our times of struggle, there will be the possibility, and the Taoists might assert a certainty, of these opposing energies in our lives. More light or good forces will balance the dark or difficult. Life is rarely all good or all bad, but balance between the two. And negative experiences I found can have like hidden blessings. It's, it's really kind of strange. I mean, it makes sense, but it doesn't always feel so good. And they can sometimes offer us a chance to learn lessons from our lives. I certainly have learned more about myself in the last three years of my mom's illness than I did at any other time in my life. And that can't be a coincidence. I'm, I'm more introspective. I'm more self-loving. I'm more gentle and aware with how I react to my emotional states. I'm more assertive and more knowledgeable, especially about dementia and the healthcare system and finances and legal matters. You know, I've grown exponentially, it seems. And then there's the difficult side, you know, it tempers this growth, the grief and the incredible stress, the reduction in like physical wellness that I feel and self-care. I'm, I'm working on this one and the loss of time to devote to other important relationships in my life. So this long list of positives and negatives exist at the same time, and I need to see both so I can benefit from knowing that the story that, quote unquote, everything sucks, that catastrophizing narrative is a lie. There are amazing things that have come into my life as a result and in balance with my mom's illness. This podcast is one. I would never have started a podcast when my mom was healthy. I would never have started writing poetry and felt compelled to tell the world about my personal growth journey. So these are dynamic shifting forces with the negative changing to positive and then back again to negative within today or tomorrow. It is the way of life. An acceptance of it helps us handle the stew of emotions that can be thrust upon us. The next step might be to accept the good and the bad as coexisting, balances to each other. Instead of labeling or casting these yin and yang forces as good or bad, we see them as a balanced flow of events and, you know, feeling states that make up our lives. I'm not really fully there yet, but I can see that if I viewed all of this as just the way the human experience is meant to be lived, if I didn't fight against the bad so much, perhaps these transient states wouldn't stick around so long. Or perhaps they would be here the same amount of time, but I wouldn't be attaching, clinging to the good so much that I negated the bad. It's really, it's baby steps in this direction. And I'm okay with moving slowly but I hope to move my thinking in that direction because fighting against these forces of positive and negative in our lives is exhausting. And some part of me just feels like it's futile too. I've also seen difficult times push me to be more resilient. You know, that word resilient is kind of getting a, a bad rap right now. And I don't like that because um, we are resilient you know, like a muscle, the more angst I have to handle, the more I bring mental, emotional, and sometimes physical resources to bear. It doesn't mean that, you know, I'm somehow better than somebody or um, that it negates all of the difficulty. But let's also recognize our own strength, our, our own ability to, um, you know, be strong and stay in this, in this like sea of emotions and still take action on behalf of ourselves and the people around us that we love. I'm also much more able to feel gratitude for the things I still have. And I cling to that gratitude sometimes as a way of handling the pain. And that's a good thing. It's not like a toxic gratitude where I'm just like, oh, I'm just so happy all the time now. And, you know, I love all of these people. It's not, it's not like that. It's much more about recognizing the depth of some of my relationships and some of the comforts that I have and just being really present with those things. 
So some days later, I sort of reflect on this hospitalization. And uh, once I've lived through it and have my mom kind of tucked safely back into her apartment, I start to reflect. And I, I think about the two blood transfusions and the IV fluids and the hand holding and all the doctor's discussions and how we made it through all those things to get to this place. And I go to pick her up from the day of discharge and she just looks bright and smiley again when I visit that morning and we're leaving the hospital and she's just had this like deep refresh while she was there. And there's her incredible smile again. My mom's smile, like it hits you deep in the chest. It warms up. It warms up all the nurses on the unit. They're always around my mom, like buzzing like little bees. And they're like, your mom's so great. She has such a beautiful smile. And I'm like, I know, I know. I'm really lucky that I've seen that smile for so long. You know, she has that smile that they're warm. They warm your soul like a soothing cup of coffee on a cold day. And they also let me know that she's still in there. Even though her verbal language impairment means that we can't have like our incredible conversations anymore. The smile, the smile of love. I've known my whole life, a smile that communicates like deep love. It's back and she looks more like herself. And it tells me something special. It tells me that those fretful train rides and those angst ridden talks with doctors and care managers and those nights of exhausted sleep and really depressed moments, they were worth it. I got her back and I know she wants to go home. And a few days later, as things settled down, I returned home one day after work and noticed this very sweet scent in the apartment. It, it's like it was almost overpoweringly sweet, so much richer than any like room freshener. And I have to take note of it. And I follow my nose to one of the vases of flowers that I've fiddled and fooled with over the week. And I've, I've freshened their water and I've recut their stems and I've taken long, deep breaths to smell their fragrance and try to be present with them, try to enjoy these flowers. But I noticed that the vase that has the lilies, I separated them with a kind of a secret wish to give them room to kind of come to life. And I really didn't think they were going to open up. But the lilies have been transformed. And two of the three lilies have opened. And they haven't just opened, they have burst open. They are huge, like the biggest lilies I think I've ever seen in their interiors, like those hanging filaments. I, I had to look it up and I found out that they're called stamen are like heavy with pollen and they hang over the interior of the flower with like this presence and they have a certain like sense of majesty. And I, I think back, I remember that worry that I wouldn't be able to enjoy the flowers because of my mom's hospitalization and it didn't happen. Another worrisome lie I told myself, and it didn't manifest into the truth. It was a twisted kind of what if that was completely false. And the truth is that the flowers outlived the hospitalization. And just when I was ready to rest and recoup from the whole hospital saga, they were home waiting for me, blooming forth to welcome me home perfuming my home and helping me settle the saga. Another example of the yin and yang of life playing out. The coexistence of pain and pleasure, dark and light, sadness and joy, hurt and acceptance. I must remember this for the next time. I have to internalize this, I think, because there's always a next time. There's always another struggle in life, but I don't think it comes on in isolation. There are counterbalances, a thick stew of yin and yang forces that play out against each other. And maybe they don't play out against each other. They play with each other. They're interconnected. And our job is to wait out the unpleasant struggles long enough to see them counterbalanced by other emotional forces. And luckily, since the world changes every minute and nothing stays the same, we can begin to know 
that both will be present in our lives. The balance has its own challenges to bear. But isn't it better to know that good forces will play out against the bad forces than to think of things as all bad? Even all good wouldn't seem right if it lasted all the time. I talked about acceptance in the last episode, and I'm returning to that topic in some ways this week. I needed to kind of think through this and talk to all of you about it and really spend some time thinking about acceptance and about these complementary, interconnected emotions and how we're going to deal with them. Try to see if you can live with the balance of yin and yang as you reflect on these questions. You can journal about them or just think about them this week. Ask yourself, one, when have yin and yang forces played out in my life? What did that look like? And two, what sensory pleasures, flowers, candles, or art would help enliven my home to allow me to experience touches of pleasant moments on a daily basis? And three, what have you learned about yourself through the struggle of a terrible experience? What strengths do you carry as a result of going through it? In the last few weeks, there have been frantic train rides and worrisome talks with doctors mixed with beautiful, fragrant flowers warm hugs from neighbors, and full-on smiles from my mom. There was yin and yang at play, and I felt it all. Now I try to rest and recuperate from the state of high alert. I try to settle in, to enjoy some music, some poetry, and time for pleasurable things that live on the bright side of the bee. Thanks for listening. Hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. And speaking of subscribing, head over to LetTheVerseFlow.com and subscribe to my companion newsletter, The Me Time Mixtape. This free newsletter offers three essential hand-curated links to creative self-care tips, tools, and strategies that you can use today to help put yourself back on your to-do list. The podcast inspires while the Me Time Mixtape tools help you put things into action. Check it out, the Me Time Mixtape at LetTheVerseFlow.com. I'll see you next time. Don't forget to stay on the bright side of the beat.